Duncan Thomas is Professor of Economics and Global Health at Duke University. Duncan, thank you so much for spending time with us talking about your research today. I'd like to start by asking you to describe your research topic under the Popov Initiative and how you feel it advances our understanding of the links between population, reproductive health, and economic development. Well, let me start by thanking you for this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very, very much. Um, it's been a great honor, actually, to be part of the network, which has been um, hugely influential in what has been going on, I think, over the last uh, few years in the population sciences. The work that we've been doing, this is with Elizabeth Frankenberg and our colleagues in Mexico and Indonesia primarily, and some colleagues in Southern Africa, um, we, what we've tried to do is attempt to assess how reproductive and population policies have affected the lives of women, not just their reproductive health, but also their health much more generally. Um, the uh, idea behind it is that to understand that women's um, um, reproductive health has improved is, is one thing. To understand that their health and well-being and that of their children and families has also improved is an order of magnitude more complicated question to address, but seems to me to be very important to understand what the full effect of population policies are. The, um, uh, the way we've gone about trying to do this is we've started out by evaluating some very specific reproductive uh, health programs, uh, some of them in Indonesia, some of them in Bangladesh, and asked what was the impact of those programs on the not reproductive health but broader health domains of women. And we looked, for example, at um, uh, general uh, markers of health, uh, body mass index and so on, in a society where lots and lots and lots of people have very, very low levels of, of nutrition, higher body mass index would be indicative of being in better health. And we established that these programs that are really targeted at reproductive health have actually benefited women's health more generally and the health of men, and most importantly, perhaps, the health of very young children. And what we've seen is, for example, the height of young children who were um, in areas where these reproductive health programs were introduced. This was a village midwife program, a very, um, uh, uh, very targeted program that was targeted at the poorest uh, communities in the country. Um, so clearly, if you were just to say, how were the women in these communities relative to women who did not have these village midwives called bidandesas. Well, the women who had the bidandesa were in much worse health because they were targeted at the poor people. So we had to uh, think through how to estimate the impact of this program and showed that it had a very uh, significant and substantial, uh, substantively important, substantial uh, impact on child height. And that was very important because until then, these programs had been viewed as being failures because, of course, what they found were all these people were in poverty. But that was because the programs were sent to places that were in poverty. So we looked at that, and then we carried on and went beyond uh, health and looked at uh, economic productivity, labor market outcomes, and also wealth accumulation. And uh, what we found was that the program, those places where they had these programs, both in Indonesia and Bangladesh, women were more economically productive and were accumulating more assets. So that's not necessarily a direct program effect. And that's the sort of thing that we were trying to get at. The reasons we th thought we should try to look at these issues is that um, there is a parallel set of questions regarding reproductive health, I think, which is, do these programs empower women? So what we found here is that um, we give women some form of access to reproductive health services, and there are all these benefits that we don't think are directly linked to just reproductive health services. So maybe these women, are in the course of getting access to these programs, are more able to navigate their family and their society. So we, we look directly at that question. What if you were to give resources to women, put aside the reproductive health programs, and just give them money? And there are some programs, in this case it was in Mexico and some also in, in other parts of Latin America and some in South Africa, where there are non-experimental designs where women were given resources and what we found was that the resources tended to be spent relative to giving resources to men. The uh, resources tended to be spent on children and sort of what I would think of as health and human capital type investments. And also a lot got saved. Um, about half of these resources got saved. That's far more that the men were saving in similar contexts. And that's very interesting because in one of the experimental evaluations in, of a family planning program, what we found was that where women had been exposed to these programs on an experimental basis, they accumulated more assets. 
So the parallel there was quite nice, that you give people power to make more decisions about their lives, their reproductive health, and so on. Their kids are benefiting through health. Their kids are benefiting through, and others are potentially benefiting through differences in the way we allocate resources, and they're saving more. And so that seems to me to, you'd like that link to be made quite tight. And so that's part of what we've been trying to do in, in this research. And so we proceeded to go down this road and ask, what is it about giving women more power that results in their investing more in the future and maybe saving more. And um, one natural idea would be that, well, women care more about their kids. You know, these men, they're just terrible men and uh, they're not good dads. And, and that certainly is certainly one model of the world. And so we actually test that. And we found absolutely, so we had to design some new methods to measure those kinds of things. And um, certainly uh, there's a ton of work that will be done to assess whether this is true or not. But there was nothing that we could find that suggested that men and women ha had uh, more or less altruism towards their children. If anything, there uh, uh, was, was some sense that men felt a greater, ten a greater need to do what was the social norm, which look, would look like altruism. So that, the idea that the women were allocating these things to their kids because somehow they cared more about the kids didn't seem to be the story. But what we did do was we looked to see whether men and women more pa were more patient about how they allocated resources. And what we found was that women were systematically more patient than men in our context. This was an important result because all of these contexts we worked in were Bangladesh, Indonesia, and uh, Mexico for this particular part of the study were um, rural areas. And when you go and look in urban areas in the United States where most of these studies are done, you find that men and women have no differences in, in their desire to be patient and invest in the future. So here we have these very poor rural people where women were really looking very clearly looking much more forward and therefore investing in their kids and all the benefits that might come when they get older and their kids are going to look after them and many other obviously benefits associated with investing in kids. And that was really, I think, um, the piece that led us back to thinking about the reproductive health program. This is a program that enables you to invest more in your children. You're going to be able to control your fertility. You're going to have a longer time frame. And this may be a piece that you really need to care about. And so that was sort of the um, um, genesis of where we went with, with, with the research. How do you measure patients? So the way we were doing it, there is a couple of ways that you can do it. One would be just actions. But the way that we were doing it was we using some of what's considered to be behavioral economics these days, where we would offer people um, both hypotheticals that we would say, well, um, you, could, uh, uh, you could receive um, um, $1,000 in a week, or you could receive $2,000 in a month. Which do you pick? And then we'd say, OK, $1,000 in a month and $10,000 in a year or $1,000 a month and $20,000 in 10 years, and ask these people these hypothetical questions. And since the questions are essentially the same for men and women, you can draw these sorts of comparisons. Of course, maybe women just like to say they want to be patient, and men don't like to say that. They see no value to it. There's no social norm. I'm not sure there is a need for a norm on being patient or not being patient. And there's some questions about, well, maybe they could use money and invest it more effectively and so on. So actually, what we also did was we gave them real money. And we actually made these real stakes where we gave them uh, money in a, a week or a month or a week and six months and uh, a week and, and, and actually two years. And we delivered. We actually paid them the real money. And in that sense, the only way that you would see women being more patient than men would be that women would have the only interpretation that would, you, would, you would get from actually giving the money would be that the women were, just didn't have very good investment opportunities. Yet what we found in the same context was that the women who got the money from these public transfers where they allocated money to women rather than men, they were the ones that were saving. So that's completely inconsistent with the idea that they had no good savings uh, uh, mechanism. The men were not. So I think that you put those two together and you've got to say, well, that looks like women are patient and investing more in the future. And that seems to me to be an extremely important insight that speaks to how are we going to empower women to help them to make decisions and to make decisions that are in not frankly only their own self-interest, which they are, and I think that's great, but also one suspects in the kids' interest because we've seen their kids are healthier. It's not that they're saving for a rainy day and everyone is you know, dying in the home or anything. They're being fed better. And a lot of their savings actually in Mexico were very interesting. They were saving in small animals which they could use, uh, pigs and stuff. And why would they save in pigs rather than cattle? Because women control pigs and chickens, whereas men don't. And so they would save in these, these vehicles that they could actually keep control over. So their, their kids are benefiting. But you know, also so is society. 
because one of the greatest constraints in many of these countries is lack of capital. And we see all these micro credit programs which are trying to bring credit into these, these people's lives. Well, if these women are given opportunities to save, as opposed to have very small amounts of money which they basically use for consumption smoothing, which is a lot of what micro credit does, you might actually see really important economic growth benefits in the longer term. And I think that's um, a, a question we need to more fully understand, but our experimental evidence from Bangladesh really suggests that these women were saving for the long term and building um, higher levels of assets. And there it was uh, uh, complicated by the fact that, of course, in many studies, you have men and women um, sharing their assets. And so you see households having more assets. And so you could. So one of the things that was very nice was that the Bangladesh data set that we were using was followed the design we had made for, for, for the Indonesia survey we designed, um, and they actually asked people's assets at the individual level. And so we could really nail down within the same household, they were exposed to these experimental programs in the same way. Men didn't save as much as women. So the change here was really quite stark, and they accumulated more assets. And so we thought that was a, a potentially important result for us to really f more fully understand and grasp. Did you find any stark differences in, in the results uh, among the countries? Stark differences, yes. And surprising um, results? Surprising differences. So the, the, I think the surprise for me, the, the um, results in Bangladesh were the surprise for me because it's not that the scientific interpretation of the results was starkly different. The mechanisms are a bit different in each of the places um, and the study designs in each is a bit different. But the result for me that was very surprising was a, was a Bangladeshi result because this is a very Muslim, Muslim country, very Islamic country, in contrast with Indonesia where I think it's a country with large numbers of Muslims, but the nature of, 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 of uh, Islam is uh, somewhat less restrictive. And I was just stunned to see that these women in these in these in rural Bangladesh, where women in many cases are not really allowed to leave the home and cannot really build a business other than a home-based business, they were accumulating more assets. I think that's staggering. And to me, that says, wow, you give this woman, you give these women just a very small amount to use and look at what they can do. Now, this is not that they did this overnight. This is over 30 years. And it makes good sense they should build assets because of course they're gonna have on average, they're going to die later than their husbands, and they're going to have to have some resources to look after themselves when they're older, and relying on your kids may not be the only strategy you'd want to take. So I could see why you'd want to do that, but I was just stunned that we saw even significant and substantive differences in that, in that context. And that suggested to me that uh, our understanding of the role of women in society is nowhere near as comprehensive and as all-encompassing as it needs to be. And in a sense, that's the question, I think, behind reproductive health programs, because if you have one choice in your life, it's going to be how to control your reproduction. I mean, it just seems to me to be, it has to be true. And we see all these other benefits that people attribute to these programs. And I think we really need to build that chain. And that's certainly what our research program is trying to do, has tried to do in the past, and I think provides some evidence and continues to, to, to develop. In disseminating your research results, when, when you get to that point, if, and I'm assuming you certainly will, have the opportunity to talk to a policymaker or a group of decision makers who really are in positions to communicate your research results and hopefully get those results into, uh, into the room where policies are being discussed and created, what, what would you want to, to tell these people? I think the first thing that's important is, I think certainly reproductive and population policy programs uh, should be designed with this idea that we want to place women at the center of decision making when we can and not have women just an afterthought. But I think also we want to integrate how we design these policies because it's also health policies, it's labor market policies. What, what I think I see here is that if you can provide more choices for women, more opportunities for women, more fully integrate women into society, uh, you will benefit. And you will benefit not just as women, but their husbands benefit to some extent, and their kids definitely benefit in a substantive way. And I think the economy will benefit if this also implies additional capital accumulation. So I think, to me, the, the, the policy that I would come out with was not a policy that I would not make a claim that I know that you should, for example, give money to women, which would be, for example, the Progresa Opportunidades program in, in Mexico, where they decided they knew that if you gave money to women, they would spend it differently. Now, I think that there was some evidence that suggested that before, indeed, some 
was my own evidence, so I was very happy to see it. But I don't know that we, I don't think we know that uh, that's necessarily a gener generally true because I can think of models that would be very counterproductive. I can think of contexts, I guess, where it would be very counterproductive where you could give money to women and she would get her head beaten and she gave it to the man. And that would be a disaster. So I, th I feel that it's much less giving money to women as giving women opportunities. And I suppose a corollary of that is I think it would be very important as a policy to educate society about the benefits of men and women having a role in society. And there's not just, you know, so I'm from Zimbabwe, and it never ceases to amaze me whenever I go home how women remain subservient to men. And I think that I don't think one can go and do culture change overnight or anything, but I do think that observing very successful women and um, um, giving women opportunities is and, and providing information about those advantages to society is extremely important. And that's what I think in many ways policymakers can do very effectively and rather than designing policies which could get completely unraveled because there's some other counter program going on such as I'm going to beat your head down unless you give me the money. And indeed, you know, we had to think about that when we were designing our study which gave money to people in a household because we were very concerned that if we gave the money to a woman and uh, she went home and the husband said, so give it over, and she got that way. So we had to be very careful about that. And I think that those kinds of things, I was rather surprised by progressive design. And I think those kinds of things may not be as effective as programs that really bring women into the economy and into society. And I think labor market is probably central. I think you know, there's all a whole panoply of what follows behind that. There's all sorts of uh, issues regarding uh, who looks after children and so on, and what's the value, you know, the, the role of uh, uh, early child development and so on. Those all filter in. That's not what my research is talking about. But I think the idea that women have a say is what this research is, is about. And I think it's, there's many policies that, ram, uh, that, that flow from that. I don't know that we know which policies and how to do it. I know those are the questions I think we want to think about. And we want to think about them in the lens of what will happen to the empowerment of men and women in this context. Well, Duncan, thank you so much for spending time with us talking about your research. It's an enormous pleasure. Thank you very much.